will not forget those who gave their lives for us, including the disproportionate number of Aston drivers. Good morning on Remembrance Sunday. Um, we remember those who went before us. Our guest today is Peter Martin. Uh, I met Peter electronically over the internet uh, on the forum where he dispensed some very clear wisdom. Um, and I then walked into his workshop and asked if there was a chap there that knew anything about Aston's. And we had a remarkably good uh, laugh and a great meeting. Um, and I thought he would be a very good guest for um, a Sunday service. And uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Peter. Um, let him start by talking about where he came from and his Aston journey. And then we're specifically going to talk about the V8 Vantage, um, the smaller of the VH platform cars that came out of Gaden. Um, uh, what it is, what the foibles with it are, what the good bits with it are, uh, and hopefully uh, people will get <coughs> uh, a better understanding of the car and and uh, what an outstanding product it is. Uh, Peter, over to Good you. Morning. Good morning, how are you all? Um, thanks for that introduction, Richard. Um, it was a little strange when someone came in and asked about anyone that knew it for Aston's, I was busy trying to think who I could speak about and who I could put in front of you. But um, we, we've had Aston's in our lives forever. My dad got his first one when he was 18, back in the early 60s. He's still got it, uh, 1930 International. And some of my earliest childhood memories are constantly carrying that ladder frame chassis around the garage because the car was perpetually in bits um, as he constantly did it up um, and he's had db6 uh, he's had 1970 vantage um, he's got a db7 as well now and he's been very active in the club and that all integrated into us my brother and i are basically the company martin's Aston services up in scotland here and um, we work just the two of us, one other, looking after every era and age of Aston. Uh, I've been in the motor trade and motorsport all my life, so it was a natural progression to end up with Aston's. And I'm just really glad he chose them and not Ford. Great. So, Peter, um, the what you're going to talk about, which is the, the, the V8, um, a lot of things actually overlap with the DB9 um, and obviously the um, Vantage V12s. But um, perhaps you'd, you'd start by talking um, uh, about the most common sort of uh, issues that are raised with uh, the car, which are, uh, are the clutch and the gearbox. Yeah, they get a lot of, they get a bad rap. Um, if you look Look on the internet and, and owners, there's and we get a lot of phone calls about specifically the transmission and clutch wear, etc. Um, to start with, sport shift. Um, every, uh, there's a groundswell of opinion you must have a manual, and I can understand that sport shift is an acquired taste. What people have failed to see is it's not an automatic as most people are used to. Uh, the standard automatic with effectively a fluid flywheel and electronics nowadays and hydraulics changing gear for you, they're very smooth, they can very seamless nowadays. The, the performance is fantastic. That's not the Vantage. The Vantage is still a manual gearbox, it's still a clutch. The difference is there's no third pedal, there's no gear stick. The car is doing that bit for you. So. In some respects, it feels like you are driving a car where the passenger is changing gear for you. Now, you can tell them when you want to change it, if you're using the paddles, or you can choose fully automatic mode and let the car do it. 
However, it feels strange and counterintuitive at first when you jump into a car that's changing gear for you because you feel the clutch being dipped, you hear the and feel the change of gear, you feel the clutch being reintroduced again. And when you're not doing it and you're not in control of it, you're very aware of it. And so I'll often say to people, especially prospective buyers, that's one of the questions, should I get sports shift or not? You want to spend the first 15, 20 minutes of any test drive just getting used to the transmission because it takes that long to recalibrate your mind to what the car's doing. Once you get over that, the next 10, 15 minutes of your test drive is getting to know the car and enjoying it. And often people jump in, give it five minutes, hate it, it's terrible. I actually quite like them. I think they're good. You get a good one, it's a nice thing to own, it's a nice thing to drive. Use the paddles, lift your foot slightly off the throttle when you're changing gear. Um, Aston will say keep your foot on the throttle, but that little lift smooth things out remarkably. Don't take your foot off the throttle, just a little reduction in pressure. Um, using the, an automatic mode, they're fine. Um, the 4.3s, etc., and 4.7s, um, Sports Shift 1 came with a comfort mode. It is pretty awful, to be honest. Don't use that unless you need to. But Otherwise, sports shifts are good. The manual box, it's, it's a nice box. Six speed, um, it's got a reputation for a poor first to second gear change. That's true. Um, and using the correct oil in it will make a massive difference. Um, there was also an update for a different um, lever in the gear linkage, cool. change the fulcrum point makes it much easier as well. However, that's an expensive upgrade. Now, it was a warranty part back in the day, but that gear lever last time we did one was 300 pounds plus fitting. You come to nearly double that because you need to drop the gear bulb slightly to get at it. So it's not for the faint hearted, that one. Most people get used to it. The second area is the clutch. Uh, now, Maria, I'd like image one just now, if you can, please. Um, the, the, the twin plate clutch, the single plate clutch discussion, it comes up constantly. Uh, sorry, Maria, that's number four. There, that's an image of all the bits you need to take off, off um, to get at the clutch. It's not a, it's not a half-hearted job in a V8. Um, you've got the gearbox, you've got the torque tube and, and drop shaft. You've got all the other sundry bits. You can see there even an exhaust manifold. So, you know, when you're looking at a, a clutch job, you've got to take into account there's a fair amount of labour just to get at the clutch. Um, let's go for number one if we can. Okay, that's number three. You're going backwards, Maria. Yes, thank you. Um, there's a comparison between a, pl a twin plate and a single plate clutch. The single plate's on the right, the dirty one, and that's what's fitted the standard. Um, it's a big old beefy manly thing, but it doesn't really do the job. There's a lot of talk about clutch wear. Um, we've seen cars with 20,000 miles and they need a clutch. We've also seen cars with 80, 90,000 miles before they need a clutch. It all depends on the driver. Um, and you get a driver who couldn't really drive a car very well, doesn't matter whether it's an Aston or not, they'll burn out that clutch, but they'll burn out this one much easier um, because it's on the limit of doing its job anyway, in some respects. And the hydraulics, et cetera, um, make the clutch difficult to push down. People then drag their foot on it. They're wearing it out. They, they use it for hill, um, holding the car on hills or at traffic lights, et cetera. Yeah, they'll wear it out in 20,000 miles. The clutch on the left is the twin plate option. The difference is to look at, firstly, the flywheels on the bottom. You can see there's a significant amount of material taken out of the lightweight flywheel on the left um, because the clutch basket, as you can see, is much smaller. The clutch basket itself is smaller. It's taller, but it's got two plates in there rather than one single plate of friction material. So it's not quite twice the amount of friction material, but certainly around one and a half, something like that. 
So you've got a lot more friction material to transfer the torque and the power to, um, to wear out effectively. So it's a far more robust unit. And again, these cars are uh, over geared in reverse, whichever gearbox you have. Remember the gearbox is the same in a manual or in a sport shift at the end of the day. Um, reversing up hills is not recommended in these cars because it's such a high reverse gear. And that can wear out the, the single plate clutch quickly as well. The, you can wear out a twin plate clutch, of course, but it's it take a lot longer and it's far more robust unit for even um, high stress times like that, reversing up a hill. It's lighter as well. And because it's smaller, there's less momentum there. So combined with the lightweight clutch, um, engine performance is significantly improved because um, it's much easier to turn. Uh, it's not a big lightweight. And also the way it revs, not just going up, but coming down, um, is far, far better. It's far more reactive. So changing gear becomes much easier. It's a joy. And it does improve the gear change slightly. We talked about first second. It makes that better as well. And the last thing is the um, clutch pedal itself, the pressure you need to press the, the, the clutch significantly reduced. There's no denying in a standard V8 Vantage, the clutch pedal is a heavy thing to use. You know, and you're going through a city, you'll know all about it. With one of these, it's like a little higher car fiesta. They're just fantastic. They're so light and easy. And it's one of the things that twin plate customers take a long time to get used to, or it takes a few miles to get used to, is recalibrating your foot to how easy the clutch is to use. Um, so I'm a bit of a twin plate evangelist, as you can hear. I think they are fantastic. They're just a win, win, win. Um, and if you get the right specialist, because it's not been developed by the factory, but um, you, it is possible to fit sports shift with a twin plate clutch option. Um, there's a few specialists out there that are able to do it, not all of them. Um, it works really well in sport shift as well. It improves the car significantly, improves the gear change, um, certainly improves maneuvering, etc. And that combined with a regular um, clutch learn philosophy um, makes the, these cars really nice to use. A clutch learn, for anyone that doesn't know, um, not relevant to sport, sport shift three in the V8 Vantage S, but the early cars, um, they need to learn where the clutch bite point is. So if you're driving a manual car and you lift your foot off the pedal, you feel where it's beginning to bite. You intuitively know that. The car needs to know that. And so as the clutch wears, um, it needs to learn the new bite point. And a clutch learn does that. If it's not done, then it keeps working around the same point. And if the clutch is worn further, it gives really harsh gear changes poor maneuverability because it's working under um, under the wrong data. So um, there's a lot of data about it on the internet. Look up clutch learn, make it part of your startup procedure. Just jump in the car, foot in the brake, keep your foot in the brake, start the car. By the time you put your seatbelt on, it's done its clutch learn. You only need to do it once. It only does it when the car is cold. If you get in the habit of doing that every time you jump in the car on the first journey of the day, it will be in peak condition. So I, I think generally sports shifts given a harsh name. I think twin plate clutch, it's an investment. There's no denying that, but you'll reap the rewards. And we've yet to have anyone that can't fitted a twin plate sports shift or manual that hasn't been overjoyed with it. But well worth considering. Okay. So Peter, having talked about the, the sports shift, there were, a couple of questions come up and what we're going to do on the questions is is save them up for the end uh, but please feel free to to pop questions up on the chat uh, we'll try and collate the ones that are all the same or similar um, and, and get Peter to answer them in the end okay having talked about how how to get the car to go better around the gearbox and, and clutch issue perhaps we can talk about um, getting the car to stop so would you like to talk about the the braking side of things yeah, brakes on um, V8 Vantage are basically exactly the same as the DB9. 
Uh, and then um, after 2012, they got bigger still at the front with 380 millimetres rather than 350. Um, they're good brakes. On normal road use, they're, they're as adequate as you probably need for most drivers. Um, what happens is most owners experience squeals and that's the biggest complaint about them, that and dust contamination. Um, usually it's because they're such big brakes and they're being used so lightly and they're such a hard brake pad material, they're just not, um, they're not getting hot enough to go through that self-cleaning process and they glaze and that gives the squeals. So don't be frightened to use them hard. The, the advice I give owners is go out and use the car and use the brakes hard, get some heat in them, let them clean. Um, if you can't get the opportunity to do that and the road conditions allow, do three or four emergency stops, not ABS stops, but certainly three or three quarters braking from 70 down to 20, get some heat in them, get them cleaning. Um, the pads, very hard pads. The pads wear out the disc um, far quicker than a, a standard road car pad, let's say. Uh, you know, you will need to factor in that every couple of pad changes, you're probably looking at this because the discs have worn down to their minimum thickness. So include that in your budgets and don't be surprised when someone turns around and says, you need brake discs as well as pads. Um, the disc condition can be a problem as well. We're looking for image five now, please, Maria. Um, one of the other issues with discs that we see a lot is not just um, wear, but corrosion on the inside, as you can see here. Again, they're little used, they're used softly, they don't clean off, puddles, etc. splash on them, and you start getting corrosion setting in. They always look fantastic on the outside. When you look through the wheel, they look great. That's what we see when we go underneath them. So, you know, brake discs can become almost as much a consumable as um, brake pads. There are options for brake pads that don't squeal as much, that don't give um, dust as much. You pay your money. You can stick with the standard option from, from Aston or you can go with a different option by a company called Porterfield. I've got no great opinion on either. Um, you make your choice. Um, the discs, I would stick with Brembo. Um, we want to go to issues, uh, image six, please, Maria, because the other issue we're finding a lot nowadays is the handbrake pads are just falling to bits with age, as you can see here. Um, handbrakes can give you a squeal as well. If you get a very low speed squeal and it doesn't go away when you lightly press the brake pedal, try very lightly pulling on your handbrake and see if it goes away then. Um, if it does, using the handbrake lightly as you're driving a lot around and again getting some heat in the handbrake pads and um, getting some warmth certainly in them may clean it off and take your squeal away. But if it persists or you get strange noises from the back, um, rotational noises, check out your handbrake pads they may have gone as bad as these. And usually, again, for some reason, it seems to be the inner one. You look at the outer one, it all looks fantastic. You take the wheel off and look at the inner one. It's a whole different story. Um, so handbrake pads can't be ignored. Um, we want to go to image mean, seven and eight now, please, Maria, because the other thing that can be ignored is the flexible brake hoses that go into the brakes. Um, you can see here that Aston have made a fantastic hose. It's rubber encased in stainless steel and then um, plastic um, and then stainless steel ends. And then for some reason, the fittings that go into the caliper and into the body are mild steel and they rust. Um, and if we go to the next image, please, Maria, you can see that they, they rust really badly and you don't want that going. So um, keep an eye on your brake pipes. We, um, we see this Pretty regularly. It depends on the service regime. If you get the right people servicing the car, it's a known issue. For example, what we do is when the pipes are in good condition, we'll coat the ends with um, brake grease and check that every service and keep that up. And that protects them enough that they last forever. However, if they've been left to the elements, you can get some pretty serious problems. 
I think we'll also speak about um, B12 Vantage brakes here, carbon brakes. There's a lot of talk about carbon brakes. Um, from my point of view, they're, they're fantastic if they're looked after properly. The advice I give owners is don't get them wet. They're designed to get wet on road surfaces. They're designed to get wet from puddles. They're not designed to get wet from getting um, jet washed when you're cleaning your wheels. They're not designed to have even alkaline free and acid free um, wheel sprays sprayed onto them, etc. Keep them dry. Don't wash your wheel and then take it for a drive to dry off the, the disc. Those um, lovely little carbon particles combine with the water, make a great grinding paste and then wear your disc away. So if we can have um, nine and 10, please, Maria. Um, you want to have your discs as polished and smooth and mirrored finish as possible. These are good discs. Yeah, the pads haven't been bedded in yet. You can see the pads down in the bottom right are still look um, black and new. They, normally, if you've, they've been bedded in properly, they'll have um, heat fading on the, the disc surface. But the discs themselves and the next image as well shows a really good discs. If you're buying a car with carbon ceramic discs, make sure they're like this. If they're rough, if they've got sandpaper appearance, walk away. That they'll need replaced and it's thousands of pounds. Um, so the other thing to think about with um, carbon ceramic brakes, I mean, you need the next couple of images, please, 11 and 12, please, Maria, is the pads. You know, normally pads you wear down to, I don't know, two, three millimetres before you change them. You usually come with, say, nine or 10 millimetres. It's not the case with these pads. Um, you can just see in the top pads, in fact, you'll see them better in the next image, please, Maria. Um, yeah, the pad on the far left there. They're big pads. There's a lot of material on them. And one of the things Brembo have done on both the steel and the carbon ceramic pads is little pins. You can just see the circles towards the bottom of them. They're like, I'm not sure of the material, but say like a brass pin. Um, to give the pad material stability when it's bonded onto the back plate. The trouble with a carbon ceramic disc, unlike a steel disc, it will wear them away. Carbon ceramic disc is too soft to do that. So you need to change those pads at around about six millimetres of pad material left because those pins start to protrude. So you can see that those pads, they have good material still left on them. However, we'll be recommending you change them then because it's a lot cheaper to change pads than it is discs if you wear them. Um, on to 13 to 15, please, Maria. The, the last image with, um, and problem with carbon ceramics, you maybe want the next picture, um, is they can crack. You can see the cracking just there beside the bolt. Um, we had this car in just recently and it's got a cracked disc and um, one of the issues is the bell mounting bolts and this crack seems to have um, started at those bolts and um, they corrode um, and they can cause stress obviously from the corrosion and either the on the back the retaining surface on the back of the bolt can snap off and um, or we're starting to see cracking from them as well so you really need to make sure your carbon ceramics are in good condition. If they're looked after well and used properly, they're great. If they're neglected, you can have expensive repairs like these. So all you V12 owners, take note, look after your brakes. Okay, Peter. So we, we've talked about brakes and actually there's some a couple of threads on the forum which uh, have similar pictures of some of the issues with the carbon ceramic uh, discs. And I would commend uh, searches on the forum to those of you who want to understand more about this. Um, let's let's perhaps turn, now go back to the, the front of the car and talk about um, the under bonnet issues, because I think there are a couple there. There are, but again, the, the message with these cars is generally they're very reliable, generally, we have no issue with them. 
generally the big units, engines, gearboxes, etc., they're good. You get issues with the peripherals on them. Um, you can get noisy belts, auxiliary belts and tensioners. They can be noisy. Um, another area we have problems with is, and again, it's well documented if you do some research on them, is um, thermostats. And we've got some images for that to show that now. So we're needing 16 and 17, please, Maria. Um, thermostats, it's quite a complex thermostat, um, as you can see. Not like the old fashioned ones with the springs, etc. Now on the left, you can see a damaged thermostat and on the right, you can see a new one. And it's that rubber ring. It's bonded onto the thermostat. Uh, the bond lets go. The rubber ring peels away, as you can see. And then go to the next image, please, which is 17. Uh, once the thermostat's fitted in place, you can see the, the, the top of the O-ring just above the springs there. Um, and that um, rubber can jam or it can let the flow of water pass. Either way, it stops doing its job. And the telltale is the, the temperature gauge. That needle and that temperature gauge should always be bang on nine o'clock when it's at operating temperature. It won't vary. Um, so if yours is very slightly down in any manner, have a look at your thermostat. They tend to last sort of four or five years. Coolant should be changed every five years anyway. My recommendation would be consider doing a thermostat as well. Not a particularly expensive component in the world of Aston Martin. So it's a good bit of preventative maintenance. Um, it's only relevant to V12, uh, V8 engine, the thermostat. V12 thermostats, different design, go on forever. Don't worry about them. Um, another area that is a problem is um, for V12 though, and v is not so much, but V12 definitely is radiators. And we want to go on to the next images, please, Maria. Um, radiators are beginning to fail. So you're looking at the second cooler in this picture and you can see along the top how it's ballooned upwards. It should not be like that. It should be nice and straight, just like the other one. Keep scrolling through them, please, Maria. You can see the damage here, they even bend. Um, and we believe with the V12, it's a pressure related thing. You can see there, that will do, thank you. That's the, the replacement radiator, uh, all aluminium nowadays, completely de differently designed for the, the top and bottom of the core. Fit and forget, last forever, they're fantastic. Um, but these radiators, you really need to keep an eye on. So take the top cover off your, your cooling package, have a look in, make sure you've got no issues like that. Um, again, V12 mainly, V8 rarely. Um, but you don't want cooling problems because eventually it bends so much that um, there's a little crack appears in one of the, the rows there. You start getting a drip of coolant out. The next thing you start getting your light on saying you've got low coolant in the system. You check the header tank and it has gone down. You fill it back up. A few weeks later, you've got the same. That's probably the culprit. So get, make sure you keep an eye on that before you end up at, stuck at the side of the motorway. And uh, the other thing with cooling systems is, oh, I'm just checking, sorry, Maria, let's look at um, number 24, please. Um, header tanks. You can see there, oh, one too far. Thank you. The header tanks crack, they're a plastic unit and you can get them cracking where they've been, the top and bottom being welded together. Um, it's not that common, but it's not unheard of. Easy thing to check. If you get a whiff of coolant, have a look at it, have a look at your radiator. Um, let's go back to those last two, sorry, Maria, because the last item for under bonnet mainly is um, air conditioning. Air conditioning is getting to that age where there, it's causing problems they're not particularly nice cars to be in without air conditioning. They do get warm in there. 
So you have an air conditioning issue, yeah, try a regas. I'm not a great believer in that. It's a sealed system. If it's not working, the gas has got out. There's a problem. You put more gas in, it'll get out again. So get it checked thoroughly. You can see here on this air conditioning compressor, there's the, the green dye at the back. The compressor's beginning to fail. On the next image, you can see um, the condenser. Um, let's go one forward, please, Maria. Uh, the condenser's got a leak in the bottom corner there. Again, you can see the green dye. Condensers usually pumps occasionally, pipes between the two often are the main problems in air conditioning system. The pipes are a difficult one because they run from the engine bay round the side of the radiator to the condenser there. Not easy to see, Aston in their wisdom put um, some foam around them and one, hot, one pipe's running very hot, one's running very cold. Eventually the condensation gets to it and it's, it has a little pinhole and starts leaking. So always worth checking those points if you do have an air conditioning issue. Um, the last issue that's often talked about is catalysts and cat warning or engine warning lights caused by catalysts. Uh, engine warning light comes up with an um, uh, emission service required message. A, Emission service required is basically Aston's catch-all for, I've got a fault, you need someone to look at me. Uh, it can often be cat, um, cat sensors. Um, they go through a self-check process and they, they come up as a problem. Um, it's mainly reaction time and often they're still working, but they're beginning to fail the procedure because they're deteriorating through age or whatever. Um, Sometimes, yeah, a really good blast will clean it all out and get it better. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be long before that comes up again. Eventually, they're going to need replaced and they're reasonably cheap to replace. However, my message is don't assume it's just the sensors. It could be all sorts of issues relating to emissions. And if we move forward a couple, please, to, yeah, there we go. If it isn't that, and you do damage your cat, this is what you're looking at, and that gets a lot more expensive. So we're wanting to look at number 29, please, Maria. That is how the standard cat should look. Um, so you can see a big difference between a broken one and a, uh, a good one. Um, so always get it checked out, always make sure it is just a, a little sensor issue and not something else, because if it is something else and you go and give it an Italian tune, you really could do a lot of damage and end up buying a pair of cats. And like everything else in life, they're not cheap. Um, however, if you do need to replace them, uh, number 27, 28 and then 27, please, Maria. Um, if you do need to replace them, go for these. They're sports cats. You can see that the the cell density in there is significantly less than the previous one we looked at. The standard one is about 1,800 cells per square inch. These are 200. So the exhaust flow is significantly better. Um, next image, please. 27. The performance cats on the left compared to standard cats on the right. Um, you can see that there's actually two cats in the standard ones. There's only one there and it's a freer flow unit as well. So there's less back pressure in the, the exhaust coming out. Uh, that also changes the sound a little bit. Doesn't make it excessively loud, but it gives it that bit more of a rumble, that bit more of a bass and baritone that Aston do so well anyway, just frees it all up. And those catalysts combined with the correct ECU tuning um, on a 4.3, you'll give you, so even a 4.7, give you up to the magnitude of 50 horsepower of a difference, but a much more free revving engine as well, because the gases can get out. And you combine them with the uh, twin plate clutch we were discussing at the beginning. That engine's a totally different beast. It's very reactive, it's very fast revving changes the car, makes it an incredible machine. So 
definitely worth a consideration. If you're looking for that wee bit more performance or whatever, especially if it's a 4.3, you don't necessarily need to spend the extra money going to a 4.7. You do cats, which are not particularly expensive in the scheme of things, and then a twin plate clutch when you need it. You'll get the horsepower of a 4.7 and you'll get the drivability of a, a, a sports car that it should have been. So um, well worth considering. Well worth considering. Okay, Peter. So having having talked about these specific things, perhaps you'd talk about servicing and maintenance in, in general and and perhaps what to be very careful of if you're thinking of going and buying one of these. And I have to confess, personally, um, uh, my next Aston will likely be a, a B advantage. Then you've made a good choice. They're great machines. To my eye, one of the prettiest Aston in a long, long time. I think the proportions are fantastic. Um, even now, they hold up really, really well. Um, and every owner that comes in thinks the same. And even people that come past our unit, we quite often get comments about how pretty the cars sitting outside are. As often as not, they're talking about the V8. As we've discussed, yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of buying advice on the internet and we've grazed just the surface of some of the things. There's other things that can go wrong with them, rear lights, um, um, suspension springs, suspension dampers, there's, there's a, a long list of things to look out for. Not all of them are relevant to each particular model. Not all of them can be a particular problem. And certainly not all of them are relevant to cars that have been well looked after and enjoyed through their life. But there are issues with these cars like any. Go on the internet, phone people like us, talk it through. Um, you'll get a lot of advice, you'll get a lot of guidance. Some, um, some of it you shouldn't listen to, most of it you should, but at least you can go out with your eyes open and there's lots of good cars out there. there yeah, there's a, there's a few tatty cars out there as well, especially nowadays, you know, the market's changed, the prices have gone down. You need to be careful, but there's a lot of good cars out there. Um, as far as maintenance and servicing is concerned, Obviously, this year has been exceptional. Um, we've got a lot of people who just haven't done any miles, which is fair enough. Um, you know, the situation has, has affected us all in very different ways. So what we are finding is there's a lot of owners who are, are coming to us and saying, I've, I've not used it. I've done a few hundred miles. We had one car had done 80 miles since its last service, another 196. We can't service that. We just tell them, look, take it back, use it when you can, let's put some more miles on. And we, we look upon sort of a thousand miles as a, a, a good trigger point for, yeah, it's probably worth doing the service. There's arguments for doing a service before it's, um, it's, um, um, laid up. There's arguments for doing um, services um, after it's laid up that, you know, we're not going to get into that today. We'll not have time. But my point is, if you think about not doing a service this year, that's fine. There's lots of people out there doing the same. They're looking towards spring next year before they start using the car again or whatever. It's not going to affect residuals. Anyone buying a car will see a car during 2020 missing a service or missing miles or whatever. It's perfectly understandable. It's not worth getting stressed over. So um, th as far as this year is concerned and this particular time for looking at a car, you need to take a view on what that particular car. What I would say is, they do, you do want to find one that's been regularly maintained and serviced. And maintain's the key word there. We see an awful lot of cars nowadays that have got a good service history. They've got all the stamps, whether it's dealers, specialists, whomever, but they haven't had the money spent on them. Any of the maintenance that's come out of those services or the correct service done at the correct time hasn't been done. They maybe just got an oil change. And we've got some examples of what we see 
every week. Um, if we can have image 30, please, Maria. Um, what we are tending to find is people are either getting very small services. And so this is the pollen filter, the cabin filter. Um, the new ones on the bottom, regularly we see them like this coming out. Now they do get dirty. There's a dirty world out there. You need to, you need to accept that. But um, bear in mind that these pollen filters are right at the beginning of your um, heating system in the car. <clears throat> Excuse me. If they get blocked up, there's an awful lot of expensive components after them. So the price of changing some pollen filters, it's a neglectful thing to do during your regular servicing. Just get them changed. And I, it's Aston said every couple of years for pollen filters. I'd agree. Every couple of years is right for pollen filters. Um, can we have 31 and 32, please, Maria? You get onto air filters again. There's the original one at the top. This is what we sometimes see coming out of cars. Now, depending on mileage, um, air filters can quite often be serviceable. We'll check them during the service. If they're serviceable, we're happy to leave them in. We'll knock the money off the bill. We'll discuss it with you and you can decide if you want them or not. And they can be left. Um, that's fair enough, but don't neglect them. Um, keep going, Maria, please. Um, they can be a real mess when we finally get to check them uh, to the point that this car had actually brought on an engine warning light um, and there was nothing wrong with the engine. It couldn't get any air. That was what was wrong with it. Um, 33 and 34, please, Maria. The other thing to watch out for, we've had this a number of times. For some reason, rodents love your air filters and um, it's not the first time we've found a dead mouse in an air filter box. So it tells you you've got a, a rodent problem to start with. And uh, also you maybe need to watch your servicing regime as well. So, you know, um, next image, please, Maria. Yeah, you know, there's just enough room to make a nice wee home in there. So get your cars regularly maintained and do all the service items. Don't just do the basics. And when you're looking for that car, Richard, make sure it comes with a good pile of receipts and these kind of areas have been issued. And, and, the, other, trap. and the other thing is check out your owners. Um, owners uh, are, are often fantastic people and you'll get a, a feel for how they look after their cars. But we also have some owners that take some risks um, we had a car come in recently, it wouldn't run, wouldn't start, wouldn't run. And um, we checked it out and it appeared that the engine ECU wasn't um, communicating with the rest of the car. So we went into the wheel arch liner and we found, you want to start with 35, please, Maria. The owner had been doing some DIY and he decided to drill a hole through his garage wall. And you can just see at the very top that he managed to go above his sides then, keep going Maria, drilled through it, kept, just grazed the bodywork, keep going, I managed to drill through his engine ECU as well. Last one please Maria. So Maria, um, owners can do quite a lot of damage unintentionally and uh, that hole went right through the engine ECU there was no way that car was ever going to start again. And it was a costly repair. £1,500 for an engine e ECU, £1,500 for a surcharge, and they weren't going to give me surcharge back. So look after your cars. Look after your cars. I have to say, Peter, that has got to be the strangest fault on an Aston anyone's ever seen. And uh, I think it's we ought to say that... Cars, that's for sure. Um, it's a it's a cottage with some very thick walls, and it was a very long drill. <laughs> it was, I believe, it was a meter long, and most of his walls were a meter thick. This one wasn't. Okay, so um, Peter, there are a, a, um, a series of questions, but but actually, they all uh, on the chat. They all um, revolve around. Um, the, the cost of the sport shift and the time and the other things. And 
Um, given the amount of information that, that, that needs to be shared, I'm going to suggest to everybody that what we actually do is that Peter and I um, prepare some sort of fairly comprehensive answers, which we post on the forum about things like the twin plate cutch. Um, so perhaps what the kit costs, um, how long it was, should take in terms of service time um, for the car and things. Um, and we will try and do a, a, a series of things like that. Now, clearly, there'll be one person's um, uh, take on it. Uh, and there are um, a number of kits that you can buy from reputable people. So um, uh, you, you, you'll have options elsewhere. Um, okay. Um, so uh, looking at the, um, the chat here, uh, as I said, most of them are about the twin peg clutch and um, the other items. Um, well, we can summarise the twin plate fairly quickly if you want to now. Okay. We'll do that. But um, to put meat on the, the twin plate bone, um, if you're just changing a standard clutch, it can be as little as £1,500. And... Um, we would always suggest you change the flywheel as well. The flywheel usually gets some heat damage. Uh, and quite often we've had the scenario where you replace just the clutch, don't replace the flywheel. And then you start getting juddering problems as you take up the drive. Um, you change the flywheel as well, you take that away. So that adds another thousand pounds onto the bill. The other thing in there is the hydraulic release cylinder. Um, they have been known to fail, it's not common, don't get me wrong, but the seal can go, they can leak all the hydraulic fluid out, they can leave you stranded. Um, we would always recommend you to ch change the cylinder as well, Again, it's, it's a, while you're in their job in that respect. However, that takes a standard clutch up to 3,000 just over, uh, including VAT. Uh, a twin plate clutch for a manual car starts at 3,300. So for £300, you get all the benefits that we've discussed of the twin plate. Um, sport shift, it's a different game. Um, you need um, slightly different components. You need to do a fair bit of laptop work as well. Um, there's um, a bit of an art to making a sport shift work correctly. And the time and the, the differences in that are reflected in the price because it's nearer 4,300. It's just around the 4,000 mark off the top of my head. Um, however, as I said to you, there's not everyone that can do it, but it can be done. And the difference is night and day. It makes a sports shift a wonderful thing to own. It's an investment, yeah, but also a sports shift, again, if you're doing your clutch learns, will not wear out the clutch the same as potentially a, a badly driven manual will. So for that investment, you will get a much longer life and be less likely to need your clutch over a much extended period of time. So on that cost versus return basis, it's still a worthwhile consideration. Okay. So there is one question uh, here from uh, Susie saying, uh, I have a periodic issue when starting my car. It goes through diagnostics and gets stuck. Just can't get there. Sometimes getting out, locking the car and starting it all over again works. Sometimes it needs a bump start. Any advice? Oh, Susie, that's a great question. <laughs> Put me on the spot there. Um, it's true that... Um, Often an ignition cycle, switching the ignition off, waiting a few seconds, switching it on again, or as Susie's doing, locking the car, leaving it a few minutes and putting it back on, um, will cure a lot of ills on Aston's generally. Uh, the fact that you're having to do that, Susie, makes me think, because when you lock the car, a lot of the um, modules and ECUs inside the car start to go to sleep and then you reawaken them. You're effectively rebooting them like you do with a computer. So assuming your battery's in good health and you've got no battery issues, I would be, I would, I'm afraid you'll have to take it somewhere and get that car plugged in. Um, you're not going to find out what's going on without checking some, um, some of the electronics with the computer, I'm afraid. Could be a software issue, 
could be a wiring issue, could be a battery voltage issue. Um, really, that's a difficult one to diagnose down the phone, I'm afraid. You'd have to. Somebody suggested to me that it's actually that I do put the handbrake on sometimes before I turn the car off that I forget and then I put the handbrake on after. No. Nah. Handbrake's not related to anything. And, and for, for that particular, um, from that particular point of view, uh, at the workshop, we never put handbrakes on. Um, we, we leave them in gear. Um, especially for automatics and potentially sport shifts. Um, a lot of people don't use the handbrake, they effectively go into park. And um, we check them during servicing and make sure they're okay. But otherwise, if you've got a car that you know we don't service and it's on a different maintenance service, you pull the handbrake, it hasn't been used in a few years and then cause yourself all sorts of problems. So if you're on the flat, I'm not worried about handbrake. Okay, if you're on a slope, for sure, use it, it's sensible. But as far as the electronics and starting and everything else is concerned, um, no, I don't think so. Is your car a sport shift or is it a manual? A sport shift, right. Is it coming up with any error message when it does it? No, okay. Uh, you're, you're muted at the moment, I'm afraid, Susie. <laughs> You can just, when it when it does it, you can just sort of hear it ticking. It's just like, it's just not quite getting there. Um, and 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 that's it. it. So you, you think the starter is trying to turn over and it's just not managing. Right, okay. Um, but the fact you get no error messages, etc. When you do get it to start, does it start normally or is it still struggling? Normally. Normally. I would be looking more at, the starter circuit and the sequence of events for it as opposed to engine. I don't think it's anything you're doing. I think you've got a fault, but you're going to have to get it investigated. But it's I've random. Been... It can be months before it does it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that can happen. But if you've got a bad connection or a bad earth or something like yeah. that, um, something moves, you switch it off, it stays in the correct position and it's fine. You, um, you rev the engine a different way, it moves slightly differently, you switch it off and it's not fine. Drive you up the wall, drive you up the wall and drive us up the wall trying to find it. I understand your, your angst. But unfortunately, yeah, you're going to have to get someone involved in that one, I'm afraid. Okay, Peter, I, I want to move to one final question. There's a, uh, a couple of questions here about batteries. How, how quickly a car is going through batteries? Um, uh, whether cars should be on triple chargers when you're or, or conditioners when you're not using them can you can you go on about that and and just before we go on let me say that uh, the the sunday service is always meant to be an hour but if if there is general interest there and people want to keep going on this i think peter would happily put some more time in so don't feel that we're going to sort of drop the guillotine at 12 o'clock no that's fine you said you were buying lunch so i'm happy to wait yeah yeah um, batteries, batteries, oh, generally the Gade and Astons, even the DB7s and the Vanquish, um, they need a healthy battery. They really are very intolerant of a, a, a low battery. And I'm not talking of a 12-volt battery that's down at 6 volts. I'm talking about a 12-volt battery that can be 11 point something. They still get a bit antsy about it. So it really is crucial to keep your battery as um, in good order and as charged as possible. Um, my usual advice is, yeah, you go to the, you've got a tip-top battery, tip-top car, you go to the airport, you leave it parked up for two week holiday, maybe even three, it'll be fine. Uh, longer than that, don't think I would leave it any longer than that. And generally, if you're garaging it or keeping it home and you have the facility to, um, use a conditioner or a, a, a charger, use it, use it. I usually tell people, you know, if you're not using it within the next 48 hours, put it straight back on the conditioner. Um, they live a remarkably long time on the conditioners. And it must be remembered, batteries nowadays are nowhere near as good as they used to be. Like everything else in life, they're just not very good nowadays. So they need that help. 
Um, we still see cars 10, 11, 12 years old and, and more on original batteries, and they've been in a conditioner all their life, and they're okay. We see other cars that have gone through battery after battery, and there's obviously an issue there. The, the issue at the moment with batteries is trackers. Uh, again, you know, you speak to anyone or look on the internet, trackers are an issue. Most of these cars were fitted with a factory original tracker um, and they're all dying. They're all getting to that age, whether it's the circuit boards failing or the internal batteries failing, um, they are becoming a major issue. And Again, you know, it's one of the things when we plug in at a service, one of the, the things we're looking at is whether the tracker has failed. And we can see that on the computer. If it is, it needs, um, it can cause either, usually two issues. It'll either start giving out rogue signals through the car and through the system, and you start getting random electrical faults. Now, the likes of Susie's, it could be tracker related. And that's why I was suggesting it's worth plugging your car in because anyone knows what they're doing, we'll see if it is a tracker issue. Um, and obviously the tracker is in, in the, the start circuit. Um, it can cause all sorts of random electrical issues. The, the flip side of it is the other issue it tends to cause is that little internal battery in it, instead of being charged when it, the car's running, um, for use if um, it, it, the car is stolen and the battery is disconnected, at least the tracker could still work. Um, its internal battery starts drawing charge from the battery when the engine's off. And it can discharge a good, healthy battery in 48, even 24 hours in the most extreme cases. So for sure, it's one of the culprits to definitely be checked out if you are having battery issues. Um, it's a relatively simple process to physically disconnect it and reprogram the car to the various electronics modules to um, effectively ignore it. And that's it. However, bear in mind that uh, there is an insurance issue there. Um, check with your insurance if you need a tracker. Some policies say they want one, some say they don't. If not, potentially you're looking at having, um, if you do need one for your insurance, um, don't go for the factory option. The, the, the same kit is available out there from other, other sources. Um, we are um, an Aston Installations fitting center um, for the Aston Fist Installations CarPlay kits, etc. And they are also a tracker fitting center. So you could get one from Aston Installations, for example, and it's the same tracker that Aston will supply you. So battery issues, those are your main culprits, maybe earths, they can be a problem as well, but make sure you get a good quality battery. We always fit Bosch, never had a problem with them, highly recommend them. Okay. Um, Peter, there have been a couple of questions about Clutch Learn, and, and at this point, can I try and explain to people what Clutch Learn is? It, it, it's really very simple. When you start the car and the engine fires up um, and you're in a sports, sports shift system, the what happens is the, the clutch circuit um, releases the clutch to the point at which it starts seeing um, rotation coming into um, the gearbox. So it, it literally just releases the clutch very slowly until you the clutch starts to pick up. And at that point, it backs off. So all it's doing is measuring, if you think of it in pedal terms, how far the pedal has to be released before the clutch picks up. So the clutch learn procedure is not something magic procedure. It is something the car does, and it does automatically, provided you give the car a few seconds. And as Peter described it, you give the car, you start the car and you give yourself time to put your seatbelt on perhaps and compose yourself before you set off. And providing you do that, the car is constantly learning on the clutch. Okay, and I would recommend that everybody does that. I would um, as well. And bear in mind what I said about it's only a cold car, so you only need to do it once a day. Um, and the early cars, there's there's no um, there's no indicator that it's doing it. Um, a lot of people say, listen for a click. That's fair, but actually the click is usually the aircon compressor kicking in um, rather than anything 
something to do with the clutch because it is such a seamless task that you don't notice it. Um, however, it's a good um, good thing to listen out for because it gives you the time scale that the car needs. On the later cars, certainly 4.7 onwards, um, your neutral button on the dashboard, um, all the dashboard gear selection buttons have a, a, a red light on them. The neutral button will not illuminate while it's doing clutch learn. So if you start your car and watch that button, it will stay off or sometimes flash and only go solid when clutch learn has been completed. So if your car has that facility, just make sure that the neutral button is illuminated fully before you move off and you know clutch learn has been done. Okay. So, um, Peter, perhaps I can just get you to talk very quickly about a couple of other things. Um, as some people on this um, call will know, I'm a, a bit of a vanquish nut. Um, <clears throat> and when buying older vanquishes, one of the things you're going to absolutely have to do is replace suspension bushes because they simply get old, tired, hard and worn out. Um, is that true about uh, V8 Vantage? Not so much. Um, the bushes are a, a completely different beast on these cars. You do sometimes get bush creep where they start moving within the suspension arm um, or um, allowing the suspension arm to move around the bush. Um, it's not overly common, but it happens for sure. The other thing that can happen with these suspension arms is um, at the rear, and this is relevant to DB9 as well, because so much of V8 Vantage and DB9 is the same in interlink. Um, there's been a few cases where on the rear only, the lower arm, outer suspension bush, uh, I would say it's probably corrosion that causes it, but the actual arm itself cracks um, around the, 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 um, the casting that holds the bush in place. So you've got the bush and you've got the arm around it and it can crack. Um, and it cracks right up the top, just where you can't really see it, obviously. Um, you need to look for it. Um, you can, if, in extreme cases, you can feel it or you can hear it either by the car moving because the suspension moves or um, a knocking noise. But it's one to keep an eye on. But generally, suspension arms, suspension bushes, they're okay. You have problems of, often when doing geometry because the bolts within them have seized or snap or break. Um, that can be a pain. But generally, suspension, the issues we see, especially in the very early cars, not so much in the later cars, is um, spring breakages. Suspension springs break at the very, very bottom. Um, basically, the last coil or so, um, they snap. The, the coating on them, like all Aston um, chassis paintwork, Aston have perfected the ability to paint all their subframes and et cetera with a gossamer thin coating of paint that lasts just until the car gets out of gating. Um, and so things can rust and the springs rust, uh, especially at the bottom there. Um, and when they rust, they eventually snap. Um, you won't feel it, you won't hear it. Most of the time it's under compression and held in place. We see it because it's on the ramp and we know, we know what we're looking for. And often it's on the inside of the spring as well to make it that bit more awkward. But it's an MOT failure, so it needs to be addressed. And it can be an expensive old job to change a pair of springs. Um, the other suspension issue is the dampers um, can start to leak, um, leak the damper, the fluid, the oil out of them. Um, it usually appears initially as a sweat around the dampers. There was a bulletin from Aston about that sweat being normal. It was left over from the filling process at the factory. Mm, yeah. Um, but you'll know if you start getting a heavy sweat or you wash it off and it comes back or you start to get drips. Um, and you've got to be careful because uh, if it's on a car you're looking at, and this is where inspections pay dividends, um, then you've got to be prepared because um, after, oh, I can't remember, I think it's 2009, um, you can't get dampers on their own. You can't get springs on their own. You have to buy a damper and spring assembly. So springs that are £350 plus VAT suddenly jump up to £850 plus VAT 
that because you get a free damper with it. So you um, you need to consider springs and dampers. You don't really need to consider much else of the suspension. Okay, uh, Peter, I, I at this point I'm going to um, uh, make uh, an, a, another. I think useful piece of information. For those of you who are on here who haven't been to it, there is a website called um, aston1936.com. It's a wonderful guy in America called Steve McAvoy, who's actually got a DB9. But um, the man has real skill in the use of WordPress and other products um, and does how-to videos and descriptions of things he's done to maintain his DB9. And as Peter says, there's quite a crossover between the two. Um, I have an aspiration for our forum that, that we get more of the um, Steve McAvoy quality um, videos and things um, put up so that there are more of the how-tos. So for example, one of the questions asked today was how easy is it to change brake pads and things? And in this particular case, somebody else said, um, actually, um, Steve McAvoy has done it very well, and he explains how to do it. So um, I think uh, it's 10 past 12. Um, I, I want to thank you all for coming on. Um, at its high spot, there were 94 members on this um, Q&A session, which um, didn't quite get to what I told Peter uh, would be 100 people, but it is, I think, the largest number we've had on the Q&A. Um, and I think we can build from it. And I, th I think it was a remarkably informative uh, run through. Uh, Peter does comment on the forum. So if you have uh, questions, uh, I encourage you to put them up on the forum, having first of all, looked to see if there are answers that cover it. Um, and I think uh, both Peter and I would, would be happy to um, put up in answers to questions in a way that is of benefit to all the members, which is what AMOC is all about. It's a membership organization. So I wanted to thank Peter particularly for um, a great talk. Uh, he turned down the Scottish accent quite hard. He refused my offer to buy deep fried Mars bars for his children to keep them quiet. Um, and the next time I'm up in Scotland uh, searching for the elusive salmon, um, I will be uh, buying him dinner. So Peter, thank you very much on behalf of everybody. Um, and uh, perhaps um, you can prepare your next one and we'll put you back on again in the not too distant future. Okay, like thank you very much, everybody. No thank you, Maria, for sorting it out. And um, we are done. There will be Q and A sessions every week um, going forward. Um, and uh, hopefully we will have people who are as informative and um, as clear as Peter has been. Um, we try quite hard and we're always happy to have suggestions. As you know, this, this was all set up by Mark Donoghue and Maria, um, and uh, I am but a latecomer to it, but we would be more than happy to have suggestions for what people want to talk about, um, which hopefully will be of enormous interest to uh, people all over the world. And, um, uh, my only regret is that that while we probably get the Australians um, at this hour of the morning, uh, we're too early for the Americans and we may start um, putting some uh, evening type sessions in so that we can bring in our Australian mem uh, American members. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.